Welcome back to the History Raid podcast. I'm your host, Kieran Kovach. Today's topic, Russia's Viking origins. According to Polish legend, the Slavic people of Central and Eastern Europe are descended from three brothers, Lech, Czech, and Rus. According to the Welsko Polska Chronicle, and I apologise if, if I mispronounce anything going forward, apart from my rusty Welsh, I am a monolingual Brit, so please excuse any mistakes I make. Long ago, the three brothers found themselves in the modern day Polish province of Greater Poland, hunting game. The three brothers quarrelled over which direction they should head and ultimately went their separate ways. Lech wandered central Poland until they discovered a magnificent white eagle, contrasted by the red of a setting sun, the modern day national colours of Poland. He took this site as a good omen, establishing the settlement of Grisno on the site. His followers and their descendants became the Polish. Czech travelled south until he came to Reap Hill in what is nowadays northern Czechia. At the crest of the hill, he was struck by the beauty and promise of the land, declaring to his followers that this place would become their new home. Unsurprisingly, Czech's descendants would become known as the Czechs. The Wel- Welkopolska Chronicle says little about the fate of the final brother, Rus, only that he disappeared into the east. Although his name heavily implies, he became a founding father himself, this time of the Russian people. The Welkopolska Chronicle's origins remain shrouded in mystery, its original author unknown. As such, it is correctly regarded as a charming, uplifting origin myth in the same vein as the, as the tales of King Arthur here in Britain, or the stories of Emperor Jimu in Japan. In reality, according to Roman chronicles, which should be taken with a pinch of salt given their well-known contempt for all peoples non-Roman, the Slavic people that settled in Central and Eastern Europe were active there from at least the 1st and 2nd centuries AD. They would ultimately absorb several Turkic Iranian peoples, such as the Scythians, in eastern Eurasia, clearing the way for Slavic settlement in the Balkans in the 5th and 6th centuries AD, resulting in the creation of the southern Slavic peoples, such as the Serbs and the Croats. Historians typically divide the Slavic people into three relatively distinct cultural groups, the aforementioned southern Slavs, the western Slavs, most notably the Polish and the Czechs, and the eastern Slavs, the Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian people. In the 7th century, mass Slavic migrations ended, and accounts of the first organised Slavic states began to appear. From here on out, we will exclusively focus on the eastern Slavs, who in the 8th and 9th centuries were a collection of disunited tribes in modern-day Western Russia, dominated by the Khazars, a Jewish tribe of semi-nomadic Turkic horsemen, who settled in modern-day Ukraine and southern Russia. The Slavs resented this state of affairs, and would see it ended with the ascension of the man who is widely considered the first ruler of a truly Russian state, Rurik. Before I get into the fascinating figure that is Rurik, there's a pretty major disclaimer I need to make. As much as it pains me to say, Rurik is one of those people who lived a long time ago in a part of the world where very little history was written down contemporaneously forcing historians to rely on what they can glean from archaeological findings and historical documents written long after Rurik's death when telling his story, most famously the Primary Chronicle, written 200 years after the events the document claimed to chronicle. As such, there is a possibility that Rurik did not exist, or existed in a very different form than described in commonly accepted histories of Russia. A possible, if somewhat spicy, comparison can be drawn here between the figure of Rurik and the figure of Jesus Christ. Most comprehensive histories of Christianity will accept the fact that the religion had a founder, 
who was present in the Jerusalem area in the run-up to the year 0 AD. Like Rurik, there is historical evidence to support this, and despite ongoing debates over the nature of Christ's existence, accepting some form of existence on his part makes for convenient history, and as such, I will be taking the same position on Rurik going forward. The single most notable fact about Rurik, as you might have guessed from the title of this episode, was that he was not a Slav, but rather he was a Norseman from a tribe called the Rus, most likely from modern-day Denmark. I'm sure you can now guess where the words Russia and Russian are derived. Rurik's believed lifespan of 830 AD to 879 AD also puts him smack bang in the middle of the Viking Age, and all evidence points to Rurik being a, being a notorious member of those seafaring warriors. Rurik is believed to have at one point been a landowner in Frisia, the modern day Netherlands. An occasional response by those suffering from Viking raids was to grant a prominent Viking and his followers land along the coastlines they had previously raided in return for their loyalty. This had the dual effect of ending those specific Vikings' raids and ensuring that if any of their former compatriots decided to raid that stretch of the coastline, they would be forced to contend with a local noble who knew their tactics and how to effectively see them off. The most famous example of this was the granting of Normandy to the Viking Rollo in 911 AD by the French king Charles the Simple. Rurik seemingly received a similar deal from the Frankish Emperor Louis the Pious, but seemingly also reneged on the deal by raiding into modern-day Germany, lands that his, that his liege lord Louis also ruled over. Rurik was stripped of his lands and was forced to return to Denmark, but did not stay for long. His political enemies at home forced Rurik to flee eastwards with his Rus tribe across the Baltic Sea, eventually finding himself in the Lake Lagoda region in current-day northwestern Russia. Shortly after Rurik's arrival, he became a prince, establishing the capital of his new princedom of the Rus in the fort of Novgorod, a center of the lucrative amber trade taking place in the region. By the way, prince has a different meaning to the early Russian people than it does for us. Until the 16th century, when Russian rulers began to style themselves as emperors, or czars, prince simply meant ruler, and was functionally no different from the kings that ruled the rest of Europe. Exactly how Rurik became a prominent local ruler so soon after he arrived in the region is a topic of much debate, but there are two generally accepted explanations. The first, laid out in the medieval era primary chronicle, was that Rurik was invited by the local Slavic rulers to become the ruler of a united Slavic state. As previously mentioned, the Eastern Slavs had powerful external enemies and also spent much of their time squabbling amongst each other. Unifying under a single powerful ruler was a logical step for the Slavic tribes to take, but that ruler, being a local Slavic leader, posed a problem. Any Slavic ruler of a pan-Eastern Slavic nation would likely display favoritism towards his original tribe, fostering dangerous resentments amongst the other tribes. Rurik, as an outsider exiled from his homeland, would not show any such favouritism, and could resolve disputes between the tribes as a genuinely neutral actor. The southern Slavs were also familiar with Vikings such as Rurik. With their narrow longships, Vikings made use of the Dnieper, Don and Volga rivers to carry out raiding and trading expeditions into the Black Sea through the lands of the eastern Slavs, earning themselves a formidable reputation amongst them. A unified eastern Slavic nation would require a strong ruler at its head, and Rurik may have seemed to the Slavs as the best man for the job. If true, this version of events is an excellent example of a people putting aside petty differences and xenophobia to unite in pursuit of a greater good. This version of events has been questioned, however. Nestor the Monk, the author of the Primary Chronicle, was a well-known scandophile, and would have wanted to present Rurik, the Viking prince, in as positive a light as possible. In light of this, the second, more underhand explanation of Rurik's rise to power could strike you cynics in the audience as much more plausible. 
Upon arriving in the Lagoda area, Rurik and his tribe may have been hired as mercenaries by a local Slavic ruler. As, as you may remember, Rurik had proven himself in the past to not be the most trustworthy of characters, and in this version of events, Rurik betrayed his employer, killing him and seizing control of his tribe, before proceeding to, to subjugate several other nearby tribes, firmly establishing himself, through violence and treachery, as a serious regional power. Rurik is believed to have died of unknown causes in 879 AD. On his deathbed, Rurik arranged for his brother-in-law to rule as regent until his three-year-old son became old enough to rule. Before I mention their names, there is an important point to clarify going forward. For the first few generations of the ruling Rurikid dynasty, most of the ruling family had two different names, their more famous Slavic names, and their Viking names in Old Norse. For the sake of clarity, I will only mention any Norse names when first introducing them, and then I will exclusively use their Slavic names. With that clarified, we can now move on to the regency of Prince Oleg, whose Norse name was Helgi, but Rurik's son Igor, whose Norse name was Ingvar. After Rurik's death, Oleg conducted a military campaign down the Dnieper River, capturing cities along the river and subjugating several powerful tribes, wresting them away from their previous overlords, the aforementioned Khazar Jews. Oleg eventually reached the city of Kiev, the modern-day capital of Ukraine, and was interested to discover that the city was co-ruled by a pair of Vikings, Askold and Deer, who Rurik had given permission to head south to raid into the Byzantine Empire, the mighty and wealthy Romano-Greek Empire that dominated the Balkans and Anatolia. Oleg killed the two wayward Vikings for an unknown act of trickery and conquered their city. Upon reviewing the city, Oleg was impressed by the defensibility of Kiev and the fertile farmland that surrounded it. It also seemed that Oleg came to share the opinion of the city's late rulers that the Byzantine Empire was a juicy target for raiding, and that Kiev would be an excellent base to launch such raids. As such, Oleg officially moved the capital of the Rus princedom to Kiev. Appropriately, this new empire that stretched over 900 miles from the eastern coast of the Baltic in the north to the coast of the Black Sea in the south would be known as the Kievan Rus. With the end of Oleg's wars of expansion, the princedom was allowed to prosper. All trade from Eurasia to Europe had to travel through the Kievan Rus, and soon the nation became wealthy off the trades in furs, honey and slaves. Kiev quickly became a major multicultural centre of trade, with Catholic Poles, Muslim Bulgars, Jewish Khazars and Orthodox Greeks all doing business under the eyes of their Norse Slavic overlords. The Kievan Rus' coffers were further swelled by raiding eastwards into the declining realm of the Khazars and southwards into the Byzantine Empire. In 907 AD, Oleg famously led a raiding force of 2,000 ships to attack the Byzantine capital city of Constantinople. While lacking the numbers or equipment to attack the city's mighty walls, Oleg created a serious nuisance for the Byzantines, disrupting trade travelling from Asia to Europe via the Bosphorus. Oleg was also supposedly bold enough to disembark from his ship and personally oversee the affixing of his shield over one of the mighty gates of the city. Eventually, the Byzantine Emperor, Leo VI, agreed to pay Oleg a ransom of 12 small ingots of silver for each of his ships, in exchange for Oleg returning to Kiev. Oleg died five years after his raid on Constantinople. According to Russian legend, Oleg was informed by some Slavic pagan priests that his death would be as a result of his horse. The superstitious Oleg ordered that his horse be sent far away. When he learned years later of his horse's death, he wanted to be sure of the news and asked for he be taken to see the horse's bones. Either out of morbid interest or a sense of triumph, Oleg struck the horse's skull with his foot, disturbing a venomous snake that lay within the skull that bit him, killing him. With Oleg's death, Rurik's son Igor formally succeeded his father as Prince of the Rus, being formally coronated in 914 AD. Relatively little is known about Igor's reign, 
the most notable event of his reign being a 941 to 945 AD conflict against the Byzantine Empire, looking to repeat the success of his former regent's raid against them. The attack against the Byzantines was well timed, with the mighty Byzantine military distracted by threats on the eastern border and in the Mediterranean, allowing parts of Igor's force to begin ravaging northern Anatolia, while the rest of the invasion fleet attacked Constantinople. At Constantinople, Igor's 1,000 ships faced a mere 15 Byzantine vessels. Keen to capture the ships and their crews, thus gaining additional leverage against the Byzantines, Igor ordered his ships to surround the Byzantine flotilla in a close-knit formation to prevent their escape. As Igor's ships moved in to board the Byzantine ships, the Byzantines unleashed their ship's secret weapon, Greek fire, a form of primitive napalm projected from metal tubes on their ships. The fires rapidly spread through Igor's closely packed wooden ships, causing panic and pandemonium. Many Rus warriors dove into the sea to avoid the flames, drowning in their heavy armour. Those who made it to shore were then beheaded by the vengeful Byzantines. After his defeat at Constantinople, and having received news that Byzantine forces were heading northwards to face him, Igor ordered his forces in Anatolia to embark on his remaining ships and return to Kiev with their loot. The lengthy process of loading the men and loot left the remaining Rus navy vulnerable, and the Byzantine navy managed to successfully ambush and destroy the Rus navy with only a handful of ships escaping. Undeterred, Igor returned with an even larger force in 944 AD. This time, em Byzantine Emperor Constantine VII chose to buy off Igor with a considerable tribute and an agreement for preferential trading arrangements for merchants from the Kievan Rus. The text of the 945 AD Rus-Byzantine Treaty provides some interesting insights into the cultural fabric of Kievan Rus under Igor, with an overwhelming number of the Kievan Rus envoys signing with their Norse names, showing a continued strong Norse identity amongst the upper classes of the Kievan Rus. When each of the envoys swore a religious oath to uphold the treaty, around half swore on Norse pagan gods such as Odin and Thor, but notably the other half swore on the Christian god. The close proximity of Kievan Rus to the borders of the Christian Byzantine Empire was clearly beginning to have an effect on the young state's religious identity. Igor would have little time to revel in his success against the Byzantines, as he would be murdered later that year by collecting tribute from, from subjugated tribes. Before organised tax systems were introduced, the only way Rus rulers could ensure their subjects paid them what they were owed was for the prince to personally visit them with a large entourage of armed men. Sometime in early 945 AD, Igor paid the powerful Drevlian tribe in modern-day northwestern Ukraine a visit to collect their tribute of furs. Shortly after paying their tribute, the Drevlians were surprised to see Igor return accompanied only by a handful of warriors, demanding yet more tribute from them. Enraged by Igor's apparent greed and arrogance, the Drevlians overwhelmed Igor's guards and proceeded to murder him. A Byzantine historian, Leo the Deacon, claimed that the Drevlians killed Igor by bending down two birch trees, tying Igor's legs and feet to the trees, then allowing the trees to straighten, tearing Igor in two. As happened with his father, Igor's oldest son Stanislav, whose name is derived from the Old Norse words for holy and glorious, was too young to rule by himself. As such, Stanislav's mother, Olga, whose Norse name was Helga, ruled as her son's regent from 945 AD to 960 AD. My research into Olga has convinced me that she deserves a future podcast all of her own, due to her sheer cool factor. For the purposes of this episode, all you need to know about Olga is that she proved a highly competent ruler, brutally avenging her husband's murder and reformed taxation. Olga is also notable for being the first Christian ruler of Kievan Rus, converting to Greek Orthodox Christianity sometime in the 950s. Olga tried to convince her son to follow her example, but Stanislav refused, insisting that his subjects would not accept a prince practicing a foreign religion. 
When he ascended to the throne, Stanislav displayed a number of interesting deviations from his Viking heritage. While he was a committed pagan, Stanislav shaved his facial hair, forgoing the long, wild beards of his Viking ancestors. And secondly, while his name was derived from Old Norse, he was the first prince of the Rus to not have an explicitly Norse second name. Soon after becoming prince, Stanislav waged a series of military campaigns, with the help of the Byzantines, to definitively defeat their mutual enemy, the Khazars, in their final redoubts in modern-day eastern Ukraine and southwestern Russia, greatly expanding the borders of the Kievan Rus eastwards. In 968 AD, the Byzantine Emperor Nikoporos II paid Stanislav 15,000 pounds of gold to assist him in his conquest of Bulgaria. The combined Byzantine Rus invasion crushed the Bulgarians, but when Emperor Nikoporos asked that Stanislav turn over the Kievan Rus occupied northern Bulgaria to him, Stanislav refused, determined to hold on to the wealth of northern Bulgaria. In 970 AD, Emperor Nikoporos was overthrown by Emperor John I, who attempted to buy northern Bulgaria off Stanislav. Stanislav refused the offer in insulting fashion, provoking a Byzantine invasion. Stanislav greatly underestimated the quality of the Byzantine military and Emperor John's military acumen, losing the Battle of Arcadiopolis, then being besieged at Dorostolon. In 972 AD, Stanislav was forced to sign a humiliating peace agreement with the Byzantines, agreeing to withdraw from the Balkans. On his way back to Kiev, Stanislav was ambushed and killed by an old enemy, the Turkic Pechenegs. It is suspected that the Pechenegs were tipped off by the Byzantines, who did not trust Stanislav to keep the peace. In breaking with Rurikid tradition up to this point, at the time of Stanislav's death he had three adult sons, Yaropolk, Oleg and Vladimir, who he had left to administer Kievan Rus while he was on his misadventures in Bulgaria. By default, the eldest son Yaropolk became the new prince, but Stanislav's sudden death meant he hadn't explicitly stated which of his sons was the true heir to Kievan Rus. Tensions seemingly boiled over in 976 AD when Oleg killed the son of Prince Yaropolk's chief advisor after a hunt saw the young man stray into Oleg's territory. Yaropolk retaliated by marching his army against his brother, killing Oleg at Orvruch in modern-day northern Ukraine. Seeking to remove all possible threats, Yaropolk sent troops north to Novgorod in 977 to deal with his remaining brother Vladimir, who fled to Norway. Yaropolk would prove to be the final truly Norse pagan king of Kievan Rus. While Rurik's descendants would continue to rule the various Russian states until 1610, Yaropolk's surviving brother Vladimir would convert the people of Kievan Rus to Christianity and definitively dissolve the Viking character of Kievan Rus and all its Russian successor states. Before 987, the idea that Vladimir would end Russia's Viking character would seem preposterous. After a year in exile, Vladimir, who used the Norse name Vladimir, returned with an army of Norwegian Vikings to overthrow his brother. On his way south to face Yaropolk, Vladimir sought to strengthen his position by sending ambassadors to arrange a marriage between him and Rognida, the daughter of the powerful Rus nobleman Rogvalod, ruler of Polotsk in modern-day Belarus. Rognido and her father refused Vladimir's offer. The reason they gave was that their family was of pure Rus noble blood. Vladimir's mother, in comparison, was a common housekeeper called Malusha that his father had taken a liking to. To rub it in even more, Vladimir was informed that Rognida would actually marry his brother Yaropolk instead. Now, quick disclaimer here. What I'm about to mention is pretty grim stuff, but I feel it provides interesting context for Vladimir's future actions. If you're squeamish at all, I would advise skipping ahead a minute or two. Vladimir was enraged by this snub, and successfully attacked Polotsk and forced Rognader to marry him. A Viking-style shotgun wedding was apparently not enough to satisfy Vladimir's bruised ego, however. Following their wedding, he raped his new wife in the presence of her parents. He then had Rognida's parents and two brothers killed. 
Rognida would ultimately prove to be only one of four wives, alongside several hundred concubines that Vladimir would acquire in his future reign, ultimately divorcing Rognida after he converted to Christianity. Kiev would fall to Vladimir thanks to the betrayal of Yaropolk's closest advisor, Blud. Vladimir would ultimately corner his brother in the town of Rodnya in June 978. Vladimir offered to discuss peace with his brother in his camp, an offer that the desperate Yaropolk accepted. On his way to meet his brother, he was ambushed and murdered by two Vikings, almost certainly on Vladimir's orders. With his brother's death, Vladimir declared himself Grand Prince and ruler of Kievan Rus. Vladimir's early reign would be defined by several successful military campaigns against neighbouring tribes to the north and east, alongside numerous displays of wealth and piety, erecting many pagan statues and shrines. 987 AD would begin to see the beginning of an event that would define Vladimir's reign, an event that would put the brutal, brother-murdering, wife-abusing Viking on the path for sainthood, the Christianization of Kievan Rus. Before we dive into this momentous event in Russian history, it is worth having a quick overview of religion in pre-Christianization Kievan Rus. From the, from the Baltic coast to the north, the Polish border to the west, the Asiatic steppe to the east, and the Black Sea coast to the south, Kievan Rus had a diverse patchwork of pagan religions. The Slavs had their pantheon of gods, the northern Finno-Ulgric peoples had their own heavily animistic gods, the Rus had brought Norse paganism with them from Scandinavia, and in the eastern reaches of the Kievan Rus, various pre-Islamic Iranian gods continued to be worshipped. These religious practices were highly localised and disorganised, with nothing in the way of standardised religious texts dictating religious doctrine, and the only thing resembling a clergy were simple collections of local priests and wise men that catered to the spiritual needs of the local population. This is not to say that organised religion did not have a place in Kievan Rus. As previously mentioned, proximity to the Byzantine Empire had seen multiple Orthodox Christian missionary expeditions into Kievan Rus that had seen some success, particularly amongst the southern nobility. Centres of trade such as Kiev and Novgorod had attracted traders from Catholic Europe and Rus conquests in modern-day Ukraine and southern Russia had seen the Jewish Khazars and the Muslim Bulgars subsumed into the Kievan Rus. While it was wise for members of Abrahamic religions not to flaunt their, their faith too openly, the pagan Rus rulers had not made it their business to actively persecute any religious groups within their realm. While there has been much speculation about the possible influence of Vladimir's grandmother Olga on his decision to re reject paganism, Vladimir's decision to convert his nation is believed to be primarily motivated by political ambition rather than any kind of desire for personal spiritual fulfilment. Exposure to the Byzantine Empire had demonstrated to the Rus the potential for organised religion to act as a unifying force in society and bolster the authority of the monarch. Vladimir had attempted to make use of Kievan Rus's existing religious landscape to foster unity in the face of frequent rebellions against Rus' rule in the form of a new grand temple in Kiev. This temple was dedicated to six different pagan gods. The first was Perun, the Slavic god of thunder and war that appealed to the Rus' Viking warrior elite. The Slavic people more broadly were rep represented by Zyagbot, the god of the sun, and Strybog, the god of the sky. The Finno-Ulgric people of northern Kievan Rus were represented by the nature goddess Mokosh, and the Eastern Eurasian peoples were represented by gods of apparently Iranian origin, Koros and Sirogor. Vladimir was ultimately dissatisfied with the results of his pagan religious politicking, and in 987 AD, after consulting with the nobility, Vladimir committed to converting Kievan Rus to an organised and codified religion. He went into this project with an open mind, organising meetings with representatives from the four Abrahamic religions already present within Kievan Rus. The first to make their case to Vladimir were the Khazar Jews. Vladimir was reportedly deeply unimpressed by Judaism. Specifically, the warlike Vladimir reacted contemptuously to hearing the story of the expulsion of the Jewish people from Israel, 
stating it was clear that the Jews' own God had abandoned them. The next meeting was with representatives from the Roman Catholic Church. While initially receptive to them, Vladimir disliked the idea of committing himself and his people to a religion of a high priest, aka the Pope, that remained totally independent from him and whose religious authority could challenge his own secular authority. Vladimir's third meeting was with the Muslim Bulgars. Vladimir was impressed by the military exploits of the followers of Islam and also found the idea of upstanding Muslim men of being tended to by virgins in paradise very appealing, but was appalled when he learned of the Islamic prohibition against drinking alcohol, declaring that drinking is the joy of all Rus. We cannot exist without that pleasure. Finally, Vladimir met with emissaries from the Byzantine Empire, representing the Greek Orthodox Church. Vladimir was impressed by the splendour of the Orthodox Church, but what really grabbed his attention was the fact that in the Byzantine Empire, the Emperor held the title of Head of the Church, granting him great influence over the religious faithful and allowing him to exert direct authority over the clergy. Despite having a clear favourite, Vladimir did not rush into this decision, sending emissaries to observe the religious services of Catholics in Germany, Muslims in Eastern Kievan Rus, and the Greek Orthodox Christians in the Byzantine capital of Constantinople. As you might have noticed, Vladimir had entirely dismissed Judaism at this point as being unworthy of consideration, with some historians identifying this moment as the point of genesis for the vicious anti-semitism that would run through Russian society going forward. The emissaries sent to observe the Catholics and Muslims returned unimpressed. The Catholic services in Germany were described as drab and boring, while the Bulgar mosques were described as dirty, smelly and miserable. In contrast, the emissaries who returned from Constantinople did so in a state of wonderment. The Byzantine Emperor Basil II, keen to ensure good relations with the Kievan Rus, pulled out all the stops, bringing the emissaries to witness a lavish ceremony in the magnificent Hagia Sophia Cathedral. The primary chronicle states that the Empire later told Vladimir that during the ceremony, we no longer knew whether we were in heaven or on earth. Vladimir unsurprisingly settled on Orthodox Christianity. In preparation for his personal conversion, he negotiated a marriage between himself and Emperor Basil's sister, Princess Anna, to create a formal alliance between the Kievan Rus and their new religious brethren in the Byzantine Empire, who just so happened to be undergoing a rather major revolt against them and were desperately asking the Kievan Rus to send troops to help them. Vladimir obliged, and in 988 AD, Vladimir was formally baptised in Crimea, taking the Christian name Basil in honour of his new father-in-law. Upon returning to Kiev, he ordered the population of the city to gather in the Dnieper River, baptising them en masse. He then proceeded to destroy all the pagan statues and shrines in Kiev, casting the great statue of Perun, his former supreme deity, into the river. Over the following years, mass conversions, many of them forced, took place across Kievan Rus. Vladimir tried to ensure as smooth a transition as possible by establishing the Russian Orthodox Church, rather than submitting to the authority of the Greek Orthodox Church. This served a dual purpose. Firstly, it ensured that Vladimir could control his new church directly, effectively accounting for unique local challenges in Christianizing Kievan Rus, rather than having to obey directives from Constantinople. And secondly, it allowed for the new Russian priesthood to give their services using Bibles translated into the Slavic Cyrillic alphabet and in Russian languages, rather than the Greek language, making the religion far more accessible to the common people of Kievan Rus. Ultimately, despite this, these measures, the transition from paganism to Christianity was turbulent, with particular resistance to the new state religion in the north where Christianity was more alien to local peoples. Pagan uprisings occurred in and around the old Rus capital of Novgorod as late as 1071 AD. Vladimir spent the remaining 27 years of his reign in relative peace, with the most notable conflict being against his father's murderers, the Pechenegs. 
Vladimir reportedly lived his life according to Christian values, personally handing out food to the needy, founding many churches, establishing schools, setting up ecclesiastical courts to give the people access to justice under the new Christian laws that had been brought in, and spending much of his time travelling across Kiev and Rus, meeting with his subjects, rather than imperiously demanding that they present themselves to him at Kiev. Upon his death in July 1015 AD, his body was dismembered, with the various parts being distributed across Kiev and Rus as sacred relics. Like his Norse ancestors, Vladimir would become known by two names after his death, but the nature of his names highlight why his death, in the eyes of Russian historians, formally ended the Viking period of Russia's history. His first name, Vladimir the Great, is in honour of his impressive accomplishments as ruler of Kievan Rus, with Vladimir overseeing a period of great security and economic prosperity for his princedom. His second name is Saint Vladimir, given to him in honour of his role in Christianizing the future peoples of Russia, Ukraine and Belarus. To this day, the Eastern Orthodox churches, and even the Catholic Church, celebrate the feast day of Saint Vladimir on the 14th of July. Unfortunately for the Kievan Rus, their golden age would not last, with the princedom slowly fragmenting over the centuries before its brutal subjugation by the Mongols in the 13th century. After almost two centuries of subservience, the descendants of Rurik would expel the Mongols and establish themselves as the preeminent power in Eurasia. With the final defeat of the Byzantine Empire in 1453 at the hands of the Ottoman Turks, the Tsardom of Russia became the centre of the Christian Orthodox world, and by the time of the death of Rurik's final direct descendant, Tsar Feodor I, in 1598, Rurik and his Viking princedom was a distant memory for the inhabitants of the new Russian Empire. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this new style of long-form content from me. Depending on the topic, I will probably continue to jump back and forth between long-form and short-form content in the future. I hope you will continue to tune in for my future raids into history.